So the, the way um, this whole system works is that in the office there are nine teams and the teams are made up by a nurse, a doctor and a secretary and those stay the same all the time so I work with the same two doctors all the time other nurses work with one or two doctors the same all the time so when you um, contact the office most of the time you'll be speaking with the same nurse the same secretary and you'll be having the same doctor as the one that's ordering your medicines and, and, um, and doing your orders for your cycle so unless one of us has a day off. Um, so in the office, the nurses work Monday through Friday. And then on weekends, everything goes here seven days a week. Nothing changes. The difference on weekends is the nurses that work in the OR portion, that is the site where you do your retrieval and transfer and recovery, they'll call you in the afternoon with your order, so you'll be hearing from them. So you'll always hear from somebody each time you come in for an ultrasound or a blood test during the IVF cycle that afternoon you'll always hear from one of your nurses between 1.30 and 4.30 in the afternoon. So the fail-safe is if you don't hear from uh, one of the nurses by 4.15, then you should call the office. But um, some days I have 10 people to call, some days I have 30 people to call. So I may call you one day at 1.30, I may call you another day at 4 o'clock. It, it just changes every day. So don't get concerned if I don't call you the same time every day. And so when, um, when you come in, so the IVF cycle is a uh, six-week process from the first period and the end of that about six-week process, give or take a couple days because everybody's different, is the retrieval and the transfer. And during that process, you could be coming in for ultrasounds and for blood testing. And to do that, we have three sites that you can go to. The first one is at, at Brigham here. And on weekdays, um, you go take the same elevator you take to the office, the Amory elevator, and go down to L1, and the radiology department is in L1 to your left. And they see our patients Monday through Friday from 6.45 in the morning to 7.45 in the morning. So it's a walk-in basis, and you have to be there by 7.45 because at 8 o'clock, they start their regularly scheduled cases. So they set aside that time just for, to see our patients before their scheduled cases begin. And what you do is you go down to L1 and you fill in, um, there's a clipboard, you sign your name, first come, first served. You usually should be able to be in and out within about 30 minutes. And then after you fill in on the clipboard, there's some sign-in sheets that they have in a, in a basket for you. It'll look like this, and you just fill in the sign-in sheet and return it to them. And then the nurse that's calling you in the afternoon gets your sign-in sheet so we know indeed that you did come in. Um, there's another site that you can go to um, on 850 Boylston Street. That's right on Route 9 heading west from here on the left. And they are also open Monday through Friday um, from a 7 to 8 that you can do your blood work and your ultrasound there. In radiology here, they have someone drawing blood during those times, so you just do one-stop shopping, go down there and have your blood work in your ultrasound. In 850, there's two uh, sites. It, it, within 850, you go to ultrasound and then go to the phlebotomist to have your blood drawn. Um, there's a third place in Foxborough that you can go to that's also from 7 to 7.30, Monday through Friday, for bloods, from 7 to 8 for ultrasounds. If you elect to go to Foxborough, um, and you're having bloods, you do have to be there by 7.30 because they have a courier that brings it all the way here to bring them to have those blood tests run. So then on weekends, these off-sites, the 850 and the Foxborough are closed on weekends so that if you choose to go to one of those sites on weekends, you'll come here to bring them. And on weekends, it's the same procedure in, in radiology um, from 7 to 8.30 in the morning, Saturday and Sundays, and they uh, see patients by appointment. So we know that you're going to be coming in on a weekend, and we'll just see, we'll ask you which time works for you between 7 to 8.30. And the reason they do by appointment on weekends and not weekdays is they're shorter staffed, and so they don't want people waiting too long. They found that system works better than if you do a drop and you may be waiting longer on a weekend. So they're trying to do it to alter the uh, number of appointments. So, um, so you can interchange these. So if you want to come here one day, 850 uh, and um, Foxborough another day, they're all interchangeable in the computer system of the orders for your ultrasounds. 
and then you're going to be getting a, uh, in your packet you should have one of these that says in cycle. So this is a standing order lab sheet. And so um, what this is is that you should each have one of these in your packet if you want to double check to make sure you do. And this is good for one year. And so each time this has any kind of blood testing that might be needed during an IVF cycle and so or after an IVF cycle if you're pregnant. And so um, just you keep this for one year and each time you go in, before each time you need to go in for monitoring, the nurse would say to you, um, uh, bring your standing order lab sheet, you're going to need the most common is estradiol blood test. And you bring that to the lab and just say, I need an estradiol blood test. They'll draw that blood test and hand this back to you. So this is a good thing to keep in your bag, whatever you uh, bring with you daily, so just to hold on to that. So every time you come in, um, we have these flow sheets that we've set up for each patient has a flow sheet. And on the flow sheet, when we speak with you for your first period, we plot in the time, that, the date that we expect you to come back, and this automatically comes up each day. Patients I expect in that I know they're either coming in this particular day or this is the soonest day I should watch for them. So if you don't come in this day and we're waiting for a period or this day, uh, I put in the soonest day and then I date it the next day, the next day, and I'm watching you from behind the scenes to make sure that you come in at the proper time. So when you come in for, if you come in for um, an ultrasound and estradiol blood test, I would have said to you, okay, this is the date you come in. You've got to come in, you've got to have an ultrasound and estradiol blood test. You already have your instructions and you already know what to ask them when you hand them your um, standing order lab sheet. So we ask you to fill in the sign-in sheet even though we have these to rely on because um, is a fail safe and we also need to know exactly which number is convenient to call you that afternoon. So um, if you haven't spoke to your nurse already um, and you're in the class today, she's got to give you a call the next couple of days and get contact information, what's the first, second, third number, that, the best number to call you at. You may have a sheet in your packet that um, asks for a list of phone numbers a best contact information and it may give you a little shopping list of things that you need to do before you get your cycle. Some of you may need to have some blood work drawn today after class and so if there's things needed you'll have a sheet that will have highlighted or checked off um, information that the nurse needs to add to one of these flow sheets to complete the flow sheet. So we all have a little different systems. Um, I usually call my patients when I see an insurance approval and find out where you are in your cycle and give a brief little summary of what's happening next and order your medicine. Some of the nurses wait till you attend the class and then they will call you after the class, fill in some of this demographic information they need and order your medicines. So if you um, haven't heard from your nurse, don't be concerned. She's going to call you in the next couple of days because she has in the system that you went to the class. If you're expecting your period or just got your period within the last couple of days, that would be a good phone call to make to your nurse before the weekend. Um, and so after the class, we ask that if you have specific questions about your protocol, so everybody has an individual protocol and you should all have a sheet that looks like this and it says the month before your cycle of grid. So um, you should have one of these. If you can take this out and just put this on the top of your pile and so when I go over the medications you'll know which medications are ordered for you to pay special attention when I demonstrate those medications. So with an IVF cycle um, the, there are several different protocols and dosages within a protocol that will be ordered by your doctor and the way these are ordered by your doctor um, the information your doctor uses is your age your diagnosis, you've all had blood testing on cycle day three, which is an FSH, a follicle stimulating hormone, and an estradiol hormone. And that gives us information about your kind of basic ovarian reserve, meaning if your FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, is on the elevated side, is a little higher than normal, then the doctor may prescribe a more aggressive protocol and or a higher dose of medication to kind of counteract that. Um, to stimulate your ovaries to produce more eggs, to have a better selection of eggs. 
if your FSH level is on the lower side, you'll have a starting dose of a lower dose. So if you have your friend that said, this worked for me, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It all depends on your diagnosis, your age, um, and your day three blood work. Um, and that's how they determine the best protocol for you. So you all have on those grids, it has um, the medication list. And with the medication list, the, it has a starting dosage. And so that starting dosage is based on that information. And the reason you come in for these frequent ultrasounds and blood testing is to monitor your estradiol level, your estrogen level. As you're growing eggs, your estrogen level increases. The ultrasounds are all done vaginally because here's your ovaries and they need to look close, get it closest to your ovaries. And they count the number of follicles, which are fluid-filled sacs that grow around your ovaries. And they measure the size of these fluid-filled sacs. So if your ovary is about this size, around your ovary, there's little balloons growing, and they measure these and seeing how many of these follicles, which are fluid-filled sacs that have a microscopic egg inside, are growing and how large they are. And then we do an estrogen level. And the doctor, when the doctor writes the orders, he or she looks at the estrogen level in comparison to the number of follicles and how big they are and guesstimates what the dosage of medication that you would need. So when you first start a cycle, you start off at the prescribed medication dosage that they've determined from that information from the day three blood work, your diagnosis, and your age. And then as you respond to the medication, they titrate the medication up or down according to your response to get just the right uh, response to the cycle. So if I call you in the afternoon and say the doctor said to take a lower dose or a higher dose, it doesn't mean you're doing poorly or doing uh, or stimulating too much. That's how they determine the correct dose. Because if I gave, if they gave the same exact protocol to two women with all the same numbers, you know, everybody responds differently to medication. So you may respond differently than someone else that has all the same statistics as you. Um, and so the starting dose is, is also is based on all that criteria. So that's why you need to come in frequently. So at the end of this, what we want is a minimum of two mature follicles. So a mature follicle measures 18 to 20 millimeters. And a minimum of two mature follicles with a minimum of an estradiol level about 800 to 1,000. So each mature follicle um, is about 200 to 300 of estradiol feeds that follicle. And that's how they titrate the medicine. Um, to get that minimum criteria in order to do uh, retrieval. Um, so the radiologists, when they give us the report for the f number of follicles and the sizes, they, in the beginning, they'll say there's many, less than 12 millimeters, few, none. And then as they grow, they list them individually, starting at 12 millimeters. So when I call you, and I'm going to tell you, you have many follicles on the right, less than 12, and you have four follicles that now are being measured that are more than 12. And then I tell you how many on the left, less than 12, and how many that are 12 or more as they start to list them. And so as they start to list them, obviously, towards the middle of the cycle, now these follicles are growing big enough for them to write the measurements of each one that's 12 millimeters or more. And that's, and then so then with that information and the estradiol level is how the doctor determines if they are going to keep the same level of medicine they started you on or go up a little bit or go down a little bit. When you start a cycle, so the beginning of the cycle, you get, you, you get your period and you contact your nurse. Um, so there's different approaches and different protocols. Um, one of the more common protocol is called, a, and I'm going to go over like a little bit about the protocols, but as I said, if you, have, if you have questions about your specific protocol, we ask you to go to your nurse and she'll review everything with, with your protocol. But basically the six-week process is you get a period, you call your nurse, you would have spoken to her before this point, um, you would have got your medicines ordered to a mail-order pharmacy, and the mail-order pharmacy specializes in fertility medication. And they, at this point, you would have got your medicine sent to your home. 
Um, it comes in a really big box and it looks really overwhelming and as you go through all the stuffing and the freezer packs is about this much medicine in this big box. Um, and so once you're ready to start your cycle, your medicines will be ordered to the pharmacy. The pharmacist calls you and gets your um, copay information, insurance information, and talks to you about any payment due in the medicines and then sends them to your home. Um, these kind of medicines can't be ordered for CVS or Walgreens because they're specialty medications and they don't keep them in stock because they're really expensive. Um, uh, the total cost of medications for a cycle is somewhere between three to five thousand dollars. So it's not something a drugstore keeps in the corner because they'll expire before they can sell them all. Um, so they go to a specialty pharmacy. And depending on your insurance, um, there's different pharmacies that your insurance will okay us to use. So if you know, if you've spoken to your insurance and you know that um, your insurance will only let you use, there's a couple of names, Freedom, Village, Cigna, Aetna, then tell that information to your nurse um, and then she can make sure she orders it from the pharmacy. Um, if you're unsure, what I do is I order it. There's two local pharmacies, Villages in Waltham and Freedom is in Byfield. And um, I'll order it to one of the local pharmacies. They check your insurance information. And if it needs to be sent to another pharmacy, they'll call and forward it to the correct pharmacy. So we'll always get it to the right place. So when you call with your period, you would have spoken with your nurse. You would have had an idea about how your cycle is going to work. Um, what I caution you, I'm giving you a ton of information this morning. So try not to get overwhelmed because each part, look at it at each segment. So the first segment is you call with your period and your nurse tells you what to do next. And the next segment and the next segment, each part of this, each, in between each time you need to come for monitoring, you would have spoken with your nurse and have the exact instructions of what to do next. So if you can just look at it over six weeks, there's probably 10 different pieces of this and each piece we're gonna walk you through. So the first piece, as I said, is when you call with your period and depending on your protocol, you will either be instructed to start taking birth control pills and if you have birth control pills on your protocol, the reason is that these birth control pills down-regulate you. What they do is they flatten all your hormones so your, new, your own cycle doesn't click in um, and everything stays flat. So if you uh, imagine the foundation in a home, everything's got to be flat so they can build on top of it. So if you are ordered birth control pills as part of your regime, it sounds kind of silly why are we taking birth control pills, but that keeps your hormones where they are the first three days of your period, keeps them flat and keeps uh, your cycle from, go, from clicking in and interrupting growing the eggs on the, um, giving the stimulating medicine that's going to grow the eggs. Or your protocol may be that we're going to tell you to um, call in day one and we would instruct you to start using condoms and then come in on cycle day 21 for a progesterone blood test. So that protocol, they're all a little different, they all get to the same result at the end. Um, that protocol the reason for that is that um, you come in on next on cycle day 21 and we'll tell you the exact date and where to go and that you need a progesterone blood test. And the reason for the condoms is that after you come in for the cycle day 21 progesterone blood test, that's going to tell us if you've ovulated during the cycle. And we're looking for a progesterone number of three or more to say that you're right on track, your hormones are where they should be at this point. And the next day, we're going to tell you to start a medication called Lupron. And all these medications that we're going to talk about are giving subcutaneous injections. These are injections that are given where you can pinch an inch, either side of your belly button or the top of your thigh, wherever you can pinch an inch. And these are all given by you at home. So if you have the Cycle Day 21 protocol um, and your progesterone level says that you've ovulated, the number is three or more, then we're going to tell you the following morning, you got to begin a medication called Lupron. And what Lupron does is now Lupron prevents your hormones from, from uh, rising, keeps them where they are at that point. Um, and um, the Lupron is also detrimental to a fetus. So if you, we'll know that you ovulated on cycle day 21, but we won't know if you're pregnant until 10 days to two weeks later. 
And so um, the reason we tell you use condoms is that occasionally, as you know, people will become pregnant on their own without treatment. And we don't want to start a medication that would be potentially dangerous to a fetus. So that's why we're telling you to use condoms when you're trying to get pregnant, but when you're in a cycle. And so however you start off with this first period that you get, by taking birth control pills for a number of days and then you finish taking the pills, that triggers your body to get a second bleed. Or you come in on cycle day 21 and you start the Lupron injection the next day for a minimum of 10 days or when you get a second bleed. So you'll both start off with a first bleed with birth control pills or come in cycle day 21 and start the Lupron the next day. And then there'll be a second bleed involved. Um, so the, uh, the Lupron, we tell you to, we'll call you when you come in for that progesterone blood test and we'll tell you to start the Lupron the next morning. We'll tell you the dosage. The most common dosage is 10 units. You may have something different on your protocol. And that again is suppress your hormones to keep your hormones flat. And then um, we'll tell you if you have, it's called low dose luteal protocol, which I don't know exactly, but I would guess about 50% of the first time IVF patients may have planned. Um, we'll tell you to take this Lupron you're going to be taking it through the whole cycle. In the beginning, we're going to tell you to take this Lupron until you get your second period. If that happens before you've taken the Lupron for 10 days, we're going to tell you to keep on taking the Lupron every single morning um, for, at, for at least 10 days. We're going to tell you the soonest date to come in. And that's where these come in because I've put in the soonest date I expect you. And come in for a baseline estrogen, progesterone, and ultrasound. If you're on a regime that starts with birth control pills, you may have your regime just to come in for an ultrasound and not the blood work. Because the birth control pills, you won't get an accurate idea with blood work because you've been taking these pills. Um, so now what this has done is you've gotten a second bleed from stopping the pills or your own body has gotten a second bleed while you've taken this Lupron. And then you come in the day after the second bleed, no matter what kind of protocol you are. Um, you come in the next day. And the second bleed, whether you're taking pills or Lupron, usually is a little bit lighter than what you normally get. So we tell you any kind of bright red bleeding you're seeing, if it's with a minimum of 10 days of the Lupron, or if it's any time after you finish the last pill, come in the next morning. And this is called your baseline. And the baseline, as I said, would be either an estrogen and progesterone blood test and an ultrasound, or just an ultrasound. And you know that because that has it on your protocol. And when, when you call with that second period, we'll confirm with you, okay, come in tomorrow, and you're gonna have an estrogen, progesterone, an ultrasound, or come in tomorrow, and you have an ultrasound. So if you ever have any questions, it's not, you know, we don't wanna leave you hanging there trying to guess your own protocol. Call the office, we're always here. And we're here till 4.15 on weekdays. On weekends, if you have any questions about your protocol or any emergent questions, you can page the f &E, it's Fertility and Endocrine Fellow on call. And there are, there are, we have three fellows that are on call 24-7. Um, and you just call the uh, paging operator and all this information is in these booklets that you have also. So whatever I'm telling you is written in the booklet too. So when, if you need the fellow with an urgent question or a question about what your next step is, or you're unsure of anything, um, you can page them by calling 617-732-6660 and ask for the F&E, which stands for Fertility and Endocrine Fellow on Call. So um, the caveat to that is that if it's late at night, in the middle of the morning, they're in their beds at home with a beeper beside their bed. So if it's something urgent, an emergency, we encourage you to page them. If it's a question about what your schedule is or when your next appointment is, if that can wait to the morning, obviously that's better to talk to your nurse and your nurse is more familiar with you too. Um, when they're at home, they have access to our whole computer systems. They can pull up your name and pull up your cycle, so they have access to everything they need, whether they're home or here. Okay, on weekends, if there's anything you need during the day, the same number you can page the fertility fellow and the fellow can answer your questions that you need on weekends. So the fellows, they are um, board certified OBGYNs. 
that are doing an additional three-year fellowship in infertility medicine, um, reproductive medicine and surgery. So when you speak with them, they are extremely knowledgeable, brilliant, brilliant people, and um, you're in good hands. So um, just to assure you that. So, so now we're going through the six-week process and so approximately the first three weeks of the six-week process, you're taking birth control pills, waiting for a second bleed. You're coming in on cycle day 21 for a progesterone blood test, starting Lupron, waiting for a second bleed. And when you come in with the second bleed, then you're starting your, ultras you're starting your baseline with an ultrasound with either estradiol and progesterone or just a plain ultrasound. And so now from this point on, this is called the stimulation phase. So this is when you're either finished the pills and your hormones are flat, or you're still taking Lupron to the very end till you get your what's called your trigger shot to trigger your uh, ovaries to um, ovulate. So if you've started the Lupron and you come in for your baseline, if you started the Lupron on your dose, let's say, is 10 units, after the stimulating medicines are starting, which are all starting the evening of the baseline, no matter what protocol you have, the Lupron is, dose is halved. So what the Lupron does is it, it's called down regulates, it keeps your hormones flat, and then we give you half as much so that you don't ovulate before we want you to, um, but your ovaries now can respond to the medicine that stimulate them to grow the egg so it doesn't um, affect the response of your ovaries. So we give you half the dose after the baseline and we'll tell you each step. You're going to take this much until this time, come in here for your baseline. When you come in for your baseline, we call you and tell you the next step and what to do next. Um, there's another approach that's called an antagonist you may have on your protocol and that's also started with birth control pills and then you, a second bleed and a baseline. The difference with that is there's a medicine that's called either Ganarelix or Cetratide that's called an antagonist. It works similar to Lupron, but that medicine is started the, uh, when the estradiol level is growing to 300 or more, and it's added in after the stimulating medicines are, are uh, started. So the Lupron is started before the stimulating medicines, um, and the antagonists are started after the stimulating medicines. Um, and so, as I said, your individual protocol is best to go over with your nurse and then to say, zone in exactly what you need to know for your protocol. So everything that's listed on your protocol, every medicine you've got to look at when I show you, is going to come in this box. And the medicines are ordered by your nurse based on an average time of taking the stimulating medicines for about 10 days. So. When you come in for this called the baseline, the evening of the baseline is when we start the medicines that stimulate your ovaries. And you may be taking these stimulating medicines each evening, and we tell you if you are taking them in the evening, take them between 6 and 9 in the evening and stay within about an hour of whatever time works for you between 6 and 9. Or you may have another stimulating medicine ordered to additional take in the morning. So any medicines that are on your plan that are ordered in the morning, we tell you to take those medicines between 5 and 7 in the morning. And the reason is the 5 and 7 hour we choose so early in the morning is because oftentimes you're going to be coming in here for ultrasounds and blood tests between 6.45 and 7.45. And you want to know that any medicines that are ordered in the morning, before you head out the door, take them because you don't want to forget one of these medicines and go to work. Um, the Lupron is always given first thing in the morning between 5 and 7, or you may have a plan that there's a second dose again between 6 and 9. The Lupron prevents you from ovulating before we want. That's very important that you make sure you get on a regime to take that even on the weekends. So, you know, the weekends you can waiver it an hour either way, but you still have to get up pretty early for those two weeks of taking the stimulating medicine. So now you've come in for your, called your baseline, and at your baseline you've signed, you know, you go to one of the places, fill in the clipboard, fill in the sign-in sheet. I've already talked to you with that first period and have the soonest date I expect you in and I'm ruling it over every day. If I don't see you within the normal realm, I'm going to give you a call. All of us will say, hey, what's going on? And touch base with you and see what's happening. So we're watching from behind the scenes. So when you have the, uh, the baseline, 
Um, the, every day at between 1 and 1.30, the doctors pull up the information. So all the information from the lab and from radiology automatically gets dumped into our flow sheet. The doctors start looking through the, um, the testing for the day, and they'll write their orders in there. And then I'll start looking at them about 1.30 to see what the orders are and start calling my patients. And so after you come in for your baseline, the next thing we're going to tell you is that if your baseline looks good, meaning that there's no cysts on your ovaries that would interfere with new follicles growing. So if you have little cysts of fluid on your ovaries and if they're large enough that they're kind of crowding your ovary and getting in the way for new cysts or follicles to grow, they may not start the cycle because you need your ovaries clean or without any cysts or any interference for the follicles to grow. That's why they do the baseline ultrasound. And they do the, if you have blood work ordered for the baseline, that's to check your estrogen level to make sure at that point we want to see that your estrogen level is low and your progesterone level is low, that you haven't ovulated again, and everything's kind of flat and quiet. And then we'll tell you that evening you're going to start your stimulating medicine that grows the eggs. And the stimulating medicine is called FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone, that stimulates the hormone in your ovaries to grow eggs. And that medicine, you, as I said, you may be taking a form of this medicine in the evening and in the morning or just in the evening. But whichever protocol you are from this baseline, the stimulating medicine continues for five nights in days if you have daytime medicine. The Lupron continues the whole time. The day after you come in for your baseline, we're going to tell you everything looks great. Tonight you're going to start your stimulating medicine. Tomorrow you're going to decrease your Lupron to half the dose so your ovaries can respond but you won't ovulate. Or we'll tell you now if you came in with the birth control regime, um, we may tell you to um, start the Lupron the evening of the second bleed and again the next morning come in for the baseline. If it's an antagonist, we may tell you just start the stimulating medicines and then after five days we look and see what the estrogen level is. They're going to add in the antagonist to stop you from ovulating. So everyone gets a medicine that's going to keep your body kind of flat so that we don't want you to ovulate before we make you ovulate and plan that retrieval for exactly two days later. So in the baseline I call you and I tell you everything looks good. Um, tonight you're going to start taking, I'm going to tell you what your dosage is of the stimulating medicine tomorrow morning. You got to take your medicines in the morning and for five nights everybody takes the medicines and then we make an appointment for you to come back after five nights of taking these medicines for an estradiol blood test, an estrogen level. And so this first appointment is just an estrogen level to see what is your starting point with this prescribed dose. Is this a good point that the doctors like how you're responding or are they going to raise or lower the medicine according to this first estradiol blood test? So from the baseline to the retrieval and transfer, if you take the cycle, the first three weeks is kind of getting your body ready to start the stimulating medicines. The next three weeks is stimulating your ovaries to produce eggs. The second half is about a two-week process. And during this two-week process, you're coming in and out for blood testing and ultrasounds um, about every, the fr at first it's five days, from that point it's every one to two, maybe three days, back and forth, back and forth, probably over a two week period, including the retrieval and transfer, we'll see you probably about um, between four to ten visits, depending on how, you, how things are going. So you'll be back and forth here. You get a break the first five nights, and after that, I expect to be here. The longest would we go is three days. It's every one to three days, back and forth, back and forth, for ultrasounds and blood tests. And so uh, the first step is after five nights of taking the medicine in days, you come in for this estradiol blood test. You get a call in the afternoon between 1.30 and 4.15. We tell you that the doctor wanted to continue the same starting dose or if the doctor decided to raise or lower the dose and when to come back again. And when you come back for the second visit, it's always an estradiol level and an ultrasound. And each visit thereafter, it's always an estradiol level and an ultrasound. So after the first five nights, just an estradiol to get the starting point to titrate the medicine. And then after that, we'll tell you come back in one, two, three days, estradiol and ultrasound each time. Um, you're back and forth, back and forth. You'll know exactly which day to come in and that you're having an estradiol and an ultrasound from that point on every time you come in. 
So the sheet has a lot of different tests. Some of those tests are tests that we may do after you're pregnant. Some of those tests are additional tests they may ask for during the cycle. But the most common test is estradiol and ultrasound, estradiol and ultrasound, each time during the stimulating phase of the cycle that you come back and forth. So where over this two-week period, now you're back and forth for ultrasounds and for blood tests. And now the doctor is evaluating the number of follicles, how large they are, your estradiol level in comparison to the number of follicles. And then um, at one point you've met the minimum criteria, hopefully more. Um, and now the, you have at least two to three mature follicles that measure 18 to 20 millimeters in size. And so when they measure the follicles, they measure these fluid-filled sacs and the eggs are microscopic, so um, they can't see the eggs on ultrasound, but the doctors know that if the follicles are 18 to 20 millimeters in size, they most likely have an egg growing in them, because that's how much follicular fluid and how big they need to be before they have an egg growing in them. And they see that your estrogen level is rising appropriately. They know now this is feeding and growing an egg. So when you've met the criteria that you have at least two to three of these mature follicles and possibly more. Um, this whole process is called super ovulation. So each month your body normally will ovulate one egg. It'll go down the fallopian tube. The sperm will go into the fallopian tube, inseminate the egg, and then it'll, the embryo will come down and plant in your uterus. What we're trying to do with either IVF or ovulation induction is to stimulate your ovaries to produce more than two or three eggs to give a better selection of inseminating these eggs and fertilization and embryos resulting in it. So when you've met this criteria, you're going to get a call from us and we're going to tell you, great news, you have, a, you have so many follicles, these are all the sizes, this is what your estradiol level is, now you're ready to proceed with your retrieval. And in order to proceed with your retrieval, now that you've met the criteria, you don't need the medicine that grows the eggs. You don't need the medicine that stops you from ovulating. Instead, you're going to get another medication called Ovidril. And what Ovidril is, does is that you stop the medication to grow the eggs. You stop the medication to prevent you from ovulating, because now we're going to give you a second different medication in the evening that's going to stimulate you to ovulate all these eggs and we time it so that if I call you on a Wednesday and I'm going to give you the exact time to take this ovidral shot and this is also a subcutaneous injection that's given either side of your belly button or the top of your thigh I'm going to tell you the exact time to take this ovidral shot because if Wednesday I tell you starting at 8 30 is the earliest time in the evening and sometimes it goes Depending on how busy the schedule is going to be, we may ask you to give a shot at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. It's not unheard of. Um, so, because everyone needs to go exactly when their body's ready. So some days are less lighter and a heavier schedule because we go with, when you're ready, you go. So when I call you on a Wednesday and I tell you, um, this is great, you don't have to schlep back and forth, back and forth anymore. Now you're ready to take this Ovidil shot. I'm going to give you an exact time. So if I tell you 8.30 p.m. on Wednesday night, that means that I'm going to tell you your retrieval is Friday morning at 8.30 a.m. And so for your partner, you'll have two days' notice for when you and your partner need to arrive for the retrieval. So at the point that you get this, we call it the trigger shot or Ovidil shot, um, we stop the medicine that grows the eggs because you met the criteria. We stop the medicine to prevent you from ovulating because now we want to time your ovulation for the retrieval. And even when we stop this medicine that grows the eggs, your ovaries still continue to grow these follicles, but at a little bit lower rate. So they time it so that 36 hours later from the retrieval, you're going to have um, the minimum criteria or more of these mature follicles for, for them to draw out the follicular fluid, they look under the microscope for the eggs and put it in a petri dish with the sperm or inseminate them with ICSI. And that's what Susan's got to go over what happens at retrieval until the transfer. So, um, so now when I call you and tell you that you've met the criteria, you're all set, I'm going to give you instructions exact time when to take the Ovidril. I'm going to also tell you that that the other shots I'll stop, just the one shot at this exact time. I tell all my patients, even it's 8.30, you know, you get involved in stuff at the house, set an alarm clock to make sure you get it at the exact time because it's all carefully based on the OR schedule two days later. 
um, we're going to tell you to um, have your partner or um, uh, if it's been three days or more at the time you get the ovidal shot, we're going to tell you to have your partner pr uh, produce a specimen and ejaculate that evening before you get the shot and a, not, not again until the day of the retrieval. And if it's been less than three days, we're going to tell you to have your partner wait for the day of the retrieval. If you're using a donor sperm, we're going to tell you to bring the donor sperm that would have been delivered to your home within the last part of your cycle. And we're going to tell you to bring the donor sperm in with you at the time of the retrieval. We'll tell you to have nothing to eat or drink after midnight the night before the retrieval. So if I call you on Wednesday and tell you to take the ovidal shot, that means Thursday you don't have to come here. You don't have to do anything. You're just letting all that percolate. Um, and that's your day off of all of this and a little break the next day you would be coming in. So Wednesday you get your trigger shot, Thursday is your day off, Friday you come in for your retrieval. Um, so as far as the um, other information that goes with this, if you, we tell you you should be all taking prenatal vitamins, um, you shouldn't be taking any Motrin, Advil, Ibuprofen, antihistamines because the way these work is that they shrink tissue, they shrink uh, in order to uh, shrink for swelling, they'll shrink tissue and it may affect the lining of your uterus. So once you start your IVF cycle, if you take any of Motrin, Advil, ibuprofen, antihistamines, you want to stop taking that. If you need anything for pain, Tylenol is fine. If you need anything for uh, cold or congestion, Sudafed is fine. Um, Robitussin DM is just the plain Robitussin that has, doesn't have any of that jazz added to it. That's fine to take. But those are the three basic medicines you can take while you're doing the cycle is um, Sudafed, Tylenol, Robitussin, and make sure you take prenatal vitamins. If you haven't been already, you should be any kind of over-the-counter prenatal vitamin is fine. You should be taking that every day. If you take any medications that you think you haven't mentioned to the doctor or nurse, then you should mention it to your nurse or your doctor um, if you have any other prescribed medications. Um, you shouldn't be taking any um, over-the-counter medications other than those. You shouldn't be, um, if you smoke, you should try to decrease or not smoke at all. Um, if you drink a lot of caffeine. Caffeine won't affect an IVF cycle, but caffeine isn't so good when you're pregnant. You don't want to have a lot of caffeine. So if you start cutting down your caffeine intake to about 200 milligrams of caffeine per day, which is a medium Starbucks, um, uh, decaffeinated, uh, I think a regular tea is about 40 to 50 milligrams and decaffeinated is about 30 to 40 milligrams. Um, and so you want to total it about 200 or so milligrams of caffeine per day if you can do that to try to get healthy before you're pregnant. Um, and um, as far as diet goes, a healthy diet is fine. Um, there's nothing specific that you can't eat while you're doing a cycle. Once you get pregnant, then we'll go over the pregnancy diet, which is no raw fish um, and there's um, no uh, deli meats and nitrates and um, there's some things for pregnancy diet that we'll go over later with you. Um, the other thing is um, about uh, exercise. If you, um, if you exercise normally in the gym, that's fine. When you get to the stimulation phase and you're close to your retrieval, your ovaries are enlarging. So you're normally going to feel that your pants are a little tight. You may feel a little bit bloated. You may feel a little uncomfortable. You may not feel like you want to, you know, do the elliptical and really go fast in the gym. So we suggest that once you get to the stimulation phase, kind of knock it down a, a notch a little bit at the gym. Um, if you can try to keep your, you know, avoid really heavy, if you're doing big heavy weight lifting, um, you definitely don't want to do that at the beginning of your pregnancy. Um, but the definition is moderate exercise. So um, this isn't a good time to train for the marathon, you know, although the marathon is coming up soon. Um, and so, but don't be a couch potato. Moder you know, brisk walk, moderate exercise, go to the gym is fine. And you have to kind of go with what your body's telling you. If you're feeling like, you know, a little stitch in your side or you're getting uncomfortable, don't do it. Just knock it down a notch to what feels comfortable for you. So while you're doing any kind of cycle, you're taking a lot of hormones and those can be dehydrating. So make sure that you're drinking at least eight to 10 glasses of fluid a day. Um, and I tell all my patients, include in that fluid half of that electrolytes like Gatorade, orange juice, lemonade, V8 juice is excellent, has a lot of electrolytes. 
because this is a strain on your body. Um, your ovaries are working overtime, and it's exhausting. You could feel, you can get to the point that you're just exhausted from the mental stress, from the trying to find a parking space, paying for parking, getting here in time, getting to work. It's a lot of stress that goes on mentally and physically. So take care of yourself while you're doing the cycle, especially flood yourself with fluids that when you go to the bathroom, you see that your urine looks like water, you're doing a great job and keep it up. Um, the best kind of electrolytes to drink is the plain Gatorade that's not the diet Gatorade, the stuff that's the bright neon colors. It's the best stuff to drink and it keeps you the healthiest by f drinking a lot of that Gatorade. Um, so any kind of fluid that you like, but once you start stimulating your ovaries and these, um, these follicles are filling up with fluid, add more fluid to your body to help to give you the energy and to also help your kidneys to kind of pee out this excess fluid that's sitting in your pelvis that's making you feel bloated. So related to that, there's a syndrome called hyperstimulation syndrome. And all of you are hyperstimulating, stimulating your ovaries more than usual. And there's three phases of that. The first phase is what we talked about, that you feel bloated, you may need to undo your pants, so wear loose pants, because here's your ovaries down here, and naturally they're growing bigger and bigger, taking up space in your pelvis, making everything feel a little tight. And that's expected, and that's when you need to eat healthy and drink, drink, drink. Um, and then the second phase is moderate, that you have those symptoms plus you may be feeling more exhausted and tired. You may be um, feeling a little bit more pressure. Um, and you want to watch yourself that you're urinating as often as you usually do, that not less than usual. Look to see that your urine isn't concentrated. Um, if you're feeling like you're gaining a lot of weight, step on the scale. You don't want to make sure that your weight is staying stable, that you're not gaining more than two or three pounds over about two or three day period. If you feel any of this, you should call and run it by us and we'll tell you, um, you know, if it's okay. So if you have questions at home and you're feeling kind of bloated and you're feeling kind of dragged out, don't worry. Call and we'll, we'll you talk to one of us and we'll talk you through. We'll look and see what your last estradiol level is. As your estradiol is growing, naturally there's more fluid that's produced and you're going to feel a little bit more symptomatic. So part of that is good, meaning your ovaries are responding, but we want to make sure we keep an eye on you. And that's why you come in and out for these frequent estradiol and ultrasounds, because we're keeping a close eye to make sure that estradiol level is, um, is below the number 4,000 and that your ovaries are producing a good num number of follicles, but not too many that's going to make you sick. And that's why the reason for when you come in, I have to go in again tomorrow, but that's, that's because we want to make sure we watch things very carefully. So there's a third stage of hyperstimulation that you have all these symptoms. Plus, you may be short of breath if you're running up the stairs. It's hard for you to run up the stairs or run down the hall, that you're getting a little wheezy or short of breath. That means this fluid here is kind of raising near your diaphragm and causing some pressure. That's the call that you can make on the weekends when for the fertility and endocrine fellow. If you feel wheezy, short of breath, if you're urinating less often, if your urine is concentrating, that's a call that you should definitely make to uh, speak with one of us about your symptoms. So you just want to get to know your body really well during this process and just watch for any of these symptoms that, uh, that happens. And if there's anything you're unsure of or anything you're anxious about, we'd like to hear from you. I, I get probably about 50 phone calls a day. And that's fine. And people, Paul, I'm so sorry for calling you. No, that's my job. And I want you to feel comfortable with the whole process. And, and there's enough um, anxiety with everybody sitting here that you don't need any added. So call if you have any questions.